He's so handsome, it's like I could die by just looking at him. My friends and I were having a slumber party when Brittany remarked on the new pizza delivery guy. We had just started a few days ago. Well, she was right. The new pizza guy was handsome. He's on his way, and I just ordered pizza from that place. As I said that, all the other girls squealed in excitement. I was not the type to easily have a crush on someone, but trust me, this guy was 100% crush material. The day I got a first delivery from him, I started ordering pizza from that place. Daily. Even though the pizza was not that good. I guess it might just be a new strategy for something since the pizza from that place wasn't great. And the place wasn't that famous either. Anyway, it worked. No one cares about how the pizza tasted, especially girls, because, because we only ordered from there to check the delivery guy out. As we were talking about the pizza guy, the doorbell rang, and everyone got excited. We went and opened the door, but this time the delivery guy was different. What happened to the other delivery guy? I asked with a disappointed tone, which I guess he sensed it. Sorry to disappoint you ladies, I come in here, but he had another delivery, so I guess you have to bear with me for today. He said with a bittersweet smile on his face, which made us feel embarrassed. Well, I can't say about the others, but I felt embarrassed enough to apologize to him. After saying sorry, I gave him my number out of guilt. And as soon as I closed the door, are you just nice or stupid? Why would you give him your number even after apologizing? It was Brittany who had said that. Well, I don't know. I guess what I said made him feel bad. So I asked him if I could apologize properly over a cup of coffee or something. I realized my foolishness as I said that, so I shut my mouth after that before anyone else could say something. We enjoyed the slumber party, but after a while we thought that we would give it another try and even order some pizza again. Brittany ordered through her phone and made a special yet bold request by saying that she wanted the hog guy to deliver the pizza. After waiting for 20 minutes or so, the doorbell rang again, and I guessed that the pizza guy was there. I asked Brittany to open the door this time because I did not want to face that guy from earlier, and when she opened the door, it was the hot guy again. We felt relieved and excited. Did you want to come inside and enjoy it with us? It was Brittany who had asked him with a seductive tone. I could tell by his smile that he was already experienced this before. Why not? After all, this is my last delivery for tonight. He smirked and came inside the apartment. The entire night, Brittany was all over him, flirting and making passes on him, which made me feel extremely furious. After enjoying the entire night, we all fell asleep. The next morning, I woke up from the loud moaning sounds coming from the bathroom. I went there to check and saw Brittany having hardcore sex with the hot pizza delivery guy. As I told you before, I don't have crushes on anyone that easily. But if I ever do, I get extremely possessive about that. And what made it even worse was that Brittany knew. And she also had a major crush on that hot pizza guy. She saw me watching her enjoy herself in the bathroom and, and she gave me a smile that felt the evilest and annoying to me as nothing else. Hey, why don't you just join us in on the fun? As I was about to leave, she called me loudly, which made the hot guy's head turn towards me as well. And at that moment, I felt the most embarrassed, even more than last night. I was feeling a rage that I'd never felt before in my entire life. And it was directed towards Brittany, because I knew that she was doing this on purpose just to make me feel inferior to her. All the other girls had already left my apartment, and Brittany also left after that delivery guy while giving me a smile, which made me want to destroy her face. The next night, I called Brittany over and asked her to hang out. As soon as she came in, she asked me if she could call the delivery guy again or not. Why not, Brittany? I guess it would be fun. I smiled while saying that. We watched movies and waited for the time when the delivery place was almost about to close, and then placed the delivery for pizza. After a few minutes, a doorbell rang and we went to the door. Brittany was surprised to see that not only was the pizza guy there, but the other one was there as well. What? Don't I get to enjoy like you did yesterday? I laughed and looked directly into her eyes, confused. She could not understand, but... And after a while, she laughed, thinking that I was going to have sex with the other guy while she enjoys the hot one. Why don't we have a foursome with some roleplay? I suggested knowing Brittany would accept it, and as I expected, she agreed. I suggested that we all put a blindfold on ourselves, and she did willingly. I could tell how excited she was without knowing what she was about to happen. I asked the Hawkeye to tie her up on the bed tightly, then remove her blindfold, and then leave right after she's turned on. He did exactly as I instructed. Well, he had to because I'd given them both enough money for them to follow my orders. I guess being rich has its perks. Brittany looked confused when she saw her blindfold removed. After that, I removed the clothes of the Hawkeye and his sex with him in front of her. I could tell that she hated watching that. Brittany had a bad habit of oversharing everything, including what she liked, disliked, hated, and I was using that to get back to her. I instructed the other guy to enjoy himself however he wanted with Brittany, and he did. 
as she was getting raped by the other guy. I was having every type of sex she liked with the hot guy in front of her, in her very own eyes. She was screaming in pain and looked at the evil side of me, which she could not believe because just last night, she remarked on me being nice and foolish. When I was done playing with him like a toy, I asked him to go and do whatever he wanted with Brittany. As he was walking towards her, she looked at him and then at me with a disgusted look on her face. I made them both enjoy themselves with her at the same time. And after I was done with my revenge, I gave them more money and let them go. And you thought you were the evil one with the little stunt you pulled last night? I looked her straight into her eyes, which were filled with tears, and I said while laughing the evilest <laughs> laugh. Even I was surprised by this side of myself, which I was enjoying at the moment. I freed her and gave her a new set of my clothes to wear. As she was leaving limping, I said with a smirk on my face, why don't we make this our thing? Enjoying the late night pizza delivery. Hey guys, thanks so much for all the support. If you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please feel free to do so. Born on January 17th of 1991, Lauren Spear was the daughter of Charlene and Robert an accountancy couple from Scarsdale, New York. After graduating from Edgemont High School in 2009, Lauren enrolled at Indiana University. She was an active and good-natured young student and volunteered for many charitable causes. For example, she had spent the previous spring break planting trees in Israel on behalf of the Jewish National Fund, combining her two passions of travel and public service. As you can imagine, Lauren's attitude made her a very popular young woman, and her circle of friends seems to have been a consistent and positive one. You see, Lauren had met her college boyfriend, Jesse Wolf, as well as her best friend, Jay Rosenbaum, during a summer camp in the hillside town of Honesdale, PA, and a handful of her other close friends at Indiana University had also attended the summer camp. The point is, it seemed that Lauren was part of a tight-knit unit of friends who both loved and trusted one another, which makes it all the more alarming when we learn what happened to her. On the night of Thursday, June 2nd, 2011, Lauren and her friends visited the nearby Kilroy Sports Bar. In an effort to save on what little cash they had, Lauren and her friends partook in what's known as pre-gaming where people drink store-bought alcohol before going out to a bar or club. The group of friends were also notorious for only venturing out into the night during the wee small hours. Kilroy's also catered to this kind of crowd, keeping their bar open until 4 in the morning, and CCTV footage from that night doesn't show Lauren and her friends arriving until about 1.46am. For the first 45 minutes or so, everything appears relatively normal. Lauren and her friends have drinks, they dance, they play pool, everything you might expect from a group of college kids soaking up the nightlife. But then, around 2.27 in the morning, Lauren's behavior takes a somewhat bizarre turn. It's around then that Lauren gets up and walks out of the bar, leaving her cell phone on the bar top and her shoes on the floor near her seat. After exiting Kilroy's, she is then quickly followed by a friend named Corey Rossman, Rossman seems confused as to why Lauren left her things behind, but seems only too happy to follow her back to her apartment complex. At exactly 2.30am, Corey and Lauren enter the Smallwood Plaza Apartments complex that Laura called home. It's here they remain for exactly 28 minutes before CCTV once again captures them leaving the apartment complex. Only instead of walking back to the bar, where Lauren's phone and shoes are still sitting there, Lauren and Corey walk down an alleyway that connects College Avenue and Morton Street, the same alley where Lauren's purse and apartment keys would be found the following day. CCTV footage then catches Lauren and Corey arriving at the latter's apartment at around 3 in the morning. This footage shows Lauren to be a little worse for wear, but Corey Rossman is somehow absolutely trashed by this point. Corey's roommate, Michael Beth, later said that he had to clean up a puddle of vomit that Corey left in the stairwell that same night, and that Corey was so drunk that he had to be put to bed. Michael added that once this was done, he then tried to persuade Lauren to sleep over for her own safety. However, Lauren insisted that she wanted to return to her own apartment, 
probably citing her need to find her missing possessions. And so at 3.30 a.m., Michael Beth called Lauren's friend Jay Rosenbaum, telling him he needed to come take care of her. We can only assume he answered in the affirmative because a short while later, Lauren shows up at Jay's apartment with a rather large bruise under her eye. Jay later said that he was worried about the injury, but after Lauren told him she didn't know how she obtained the bruise, Jay assumed she'd gotten it during a drunken fall from earlier in the evening. However, of all the CCTV footage we have of Lauren and her friends, there are no recorded incidents of falling, and no recorded incidences of people fussing over her eye, which we could then use to estimate the time and place of such an injury. By 4.30 a.m., Lauren hasn't had an alcoholic drink in over two hours and is no doubt beginning to sober up. Granted, she wouldn't have been in the best condition of her life, but she is no doubt realizing that she's lost pretty much everything she brought out with her, being her phone, keys, shoes, and purse. In light of this, we can understand why Lauren was reluctant to sleep it off when she could actively go about recovering some of her lost items. Lauren then left Jay Rosenbaum's apartment at around 4.30 that morning, last being sighted on CCTV footage headed south from the intersection of 11th Street and College Avenue. Several hours later, Lauren's boyfriend, Jesse Wolf, sent her a text which she failed to reply to, and when reply did finally roll in, it was from an employee of Kilroy Sports Bar, saying Lauren had left her phone there overnight. Not long after, Given he had zero means of getting in touch with her, no one had seen her that morning. Jesse contacted the local campus police to report Lauren missing. After three weeks of fruitless search, August of 2011 saw local police and FBI agents undertake a week-long search of the nearby Sycamore Ridge landfill site. Needless to say, it wasn't looking good for Lauren, as cops were evidently looking for a body, or more accurately, parts of a body as opposed to a living, breathing person. But despite their efforts, law enforcement didn't manage to find a single shred of evidence that clued them into Lauren's condition or where she might be. The investigation dragged on for years without a break, and this is in spite of more than 3,000 tips called in from the general public. Then, on the morning of April 25, 2015, a hint of Lauren's fate was unearthed not far from where she went missing, yet it goes without saying that it was not a good one. The lifeless corpse of a University of Indiana student, Hannah Wilson, was discovered in neighboring Brown County. She was last seen getting into a taxi in front of the very same bar that Lauren had visited on the night of her disappearance. Lying on the ground near her body was a cell phone, one that police determined was owned by a local 50-year-old man by the name of Daniel Messel. He was arrested, tried, and convicted of Hannah's murder, and police deduced that he might well be the same person responsible for Lauren Spearer's disappearance too. However, in July of that same year, nationally renowned private investigator Bo Deedle concluded that after his own extensive investigation, he'd found nothing to seriously link Hannah's murder to Lauren's apparent abduction, and any similarities were purely coincidental. Yet right when it seemed that all hope was lost, the winter that followed Hannah Wilson's murder saw the FBI pursue its first serious lead. In the early hours of January 28, 2016, FBI agents were assisted by local law enforcement in serving a search warrant to a property in the 2900 block of Old Morgantown Road in Martinsville, approximately 20 miles north of Bloomington. The rather dry official statement from law enforcement was that they were following up on leads and tips in Morgan County regarding the disappearance of Lauren Spearer. But in reality, they had strong suspicions that a man named Justin Wagers was responsible for her murder or abduction. Wagers, who lived with his mother and stepfather, had been named and identified on multiple occasions as having exposed himself to local women during incidents that were characterized by aggressive, and generally terrifying displays of depravity. Cops let cadaver dogs loose in the wager's home, and found that they indicated for human remains in a nearby barn. However, after conducting a dig and sifting dirt from the floor of the structure, investigators found zero evidence of anyone having been buried there. 
As the years went by, Lauren's parents sadly announced that they believed their daughter to be deceased. Yet they've also been very open about their suspicions that someone very close to her may have been involved in her disappearance. Not only have they wondered aloud if someone might have slipped something in her drink while she was at Kilroy's, they also had no qualms with casting suspicion on the men she was with that night. Lauren's boyfriend at the time, Jesse Wolf, has also professed his distrust of Corey Rossman, Michael Beth, and Jay Rosenbaum, as not only did all three refuse to take police-issued polygraph tests, but all three lawyered up in the days following her disappearance, apparently completely unprompted to do so, as she was still considered very much alive at that time. Rossman, Beth, and Rosenbaum then publicly stated that they had passed privately administered polygraph tests, which apparently proved their innocence. They were also completely unapologetic regarding them hiring attorneys, and stated that their refusal to cooperate with Bloomington police was down to them not trusting law enforcement. A theory was batted around that Lauren may have died as a result of a drug overdose, one resulting from narcotics obtained from either Rossman, Beth, or Rosenbaum. If that was the case, it's plausible that all three or a combination of the men could have conspired to dispose of her body so that their guilt would never be suspected. Obviously, Hiring lawyers and refusing to take a polygraph doesn't exactly make the three guys look good. But in all fairness, it's highly inadvisable to talk to police officers without a lawyer present, especially since all three guys knew well their friend was missing. What's more, polygraphs are so unreliable that they're no longer admissible in court, and the police were most likely just looking to get the three guys in an interview room so they could browbeat them into incriminating themselves. So... In light of that, we have to consider other options. But having exhausted the possibilities of either Daniel Messel or Justin Wager having killed her, time and time again we're forced to consider the accidental overdose angle. I truly don't think it was a random abduction. I think that somebody that Lauren knew was responsible for the events of that evening, her mother publicly stated in 2014. And she may well be correct. Statistically, most people are murdered by someone they know, sometimes pretty intimately too. And it doesn't seem out of the question that those three young men with big bright futures ahead of them wouldn't want to throw them away by admitting they'd given a girl too much to drink or too much of something a little less than legal. So as much as people focus on stranger danger, or of that random creeper who becomes the source of their untimely demise, maybe people should start looking a little closer to home to those who profess to love or care for us, who might actually disappear us, dispose of our body, or bury our names, just to protect themselves. This happened a few years ago, and sometimes I still have nightmares about not getting away. Let me start off by saying that I live in a pretty big city, Lots of bars and clubs, and I have experience with partying and drugs. I have been in blackout drunk situations, and this was not that. But I no longer go out on my own. That night, I decided to go out with some friends bar hopping. I mainly knew only one of the girls that I hung out with regularly, and the other two were more acquaintances. I was very outgoing and loved meeting people so that was nothing new for me. We had a few drinks at a bar and continued on to the next one. We were having fun and a great time when one of the girls I didn't know well pulled out the party stuff sometime during our second bar visit. I decided to skip it because I wasn't looking to get messed up that night, but my friend said yes and she and the third girl went to the bathroom. The second girl, let's call her Bob, kept insisting I go with the two others. I kept declining, but she got a little aggressive. After the third time I'd said no, my friend came back from the bathroom and Bob acted like nothing had just happened. Then we met some guys who joined our group to have a flirt, and I was in a relationship, but my friend and Bob weren't. By the time the second girl had left and Bob and my friend was starting to get pretty messed up. I went to use the bathroom and texted my boyfriend that I was coming home soon, but saw that my phone was dead. 
When I came back to the table, the guys had given his shots. I was still pretty sober and declined the shot. But Bob shoved the shot into my hand, so to avoid a scene, I took it. I then went to tell my friend that I was heading home, but I took one look at hers and Bob's faces and I could see they were out of it. I was starting to feel pretty woozy myself at that point, so I grabbed all our stuff and started shoving them to go. The guys that bought the shots were protesting, but I wasn't getting any resistance from the girls. I hailed a cab, my phone was dead. So no Uber, and I remembered putting the girls in the back and telling the driver that we were dropping them off first, then going to my address. During the journey, I blacked out, but I remember dropping off my friend. Then I blacked out again and was alone with the driver. I was in the front seat and he was holding my hand. I looked around disoriented. I took in the sight of him holding my hand while striving, like he was my boyfriend or something. I saw my wallet in the center cup holder and the meter was off. He was telling me that he was taking me to a romantic place, but I told him no, and to please take me home as my boyfriend was waiting for me. He then said something along the lines of stop talking about him. I told you which in hindsight indicates that I had told him already many times about him. He said he just wanted to pretend for a little and held my hand tighter. I didn't want to trigger a violent reaction, so I let my hand where it was and started to reach for my wallet with my other. He saw me let go of my hand and took my wallet from the cup holder to his other side where I couldn't reach it. I was still woozy and blacked out again, and when I came to my senses, we were parked near a very well-known romantic and touristy location in my city. Normally, this place was packed, but not that night is pretty far from anything else and surrounded by woods. I started to cry and begged him to please take me home because I wanted to see my boyfriend and that I would tell anyone what he was doing. He looked at me and said, I will take you home if you pretend you are my girlfriend for a little while. I sat there in shock, wishing my brain wasn't much. I wished, in fact, that I had never gone out in the first place. I wished I could see my boyfriend for the thousandth time that night. I said okay, and he smiled, put my wallet back in the cup holder, and I took it slowly, putting it under my leg. He took my hand and looked out the front window and out into the little lake that he had brought me to. He then started talking, but I don't remember what he was saying. I was just trying not to black out again. I waited for him to look at me and asked again for him to please take me home. He said only if I let him give me a kiss. I said no. He looked mad for a fraction of a second, and then squeezed the hand was still holding. He then leaned in fast and kissed me anyway, but I kept my lips sealed tight against him ready to fight ready to bite and scratch and not go down easily. He let go of my hand and backed away, then started the car and we finally began our way back to civilization. I was crying as silently as possible, trying not to be heard, so he would forget I was there and not touch me. I waited until we were near enough people that I could bolt out of the car and find another way home but I think he saw me grabbing my wallet from under my leg and knew my intention to jump out at the next light. He snatched it again and said he would drive me. So I nodded as by then I didn't care about the wallet, my phone, or anything else. I just needed to jump out no matter what, as I was going to get home. I had no clue what time it was by then either, but I do know there was almost no cars out of my usual busy city, no buses, and no people. But I didn't care anymore. He eventually stopped at a red light, and I unlocked the door, yanked it open, ran, and didn't look back. But I heard a car peel out of the intersection, and he was running to my phone, still dead. No wallet, so no money. And really far from the house, I was still drowsy and crying, and I had no idea of the time. I started walking then, when I heard a car pull up near me. I started running instinctively when I heard a woman's voice yell out, Are you okay? I stopped and turned around to the most beautiful person I have ever seen in the entire world, walking towards me slowly with her hands out in front as not to scare me. 
I started crying harder, being the most incoherent that I've ever been. She hugged me so hard and asked for my boyfriend's number so she could call him. He answered straight away, and she told him where I was and that I was okay. And she was bringing me home. I cried the whole way back, trying to explain what had happened, but still woozy, still freaking out. It was hard. So we drove in relative silence. When we got home, my boyfriend was waiting outside, losing his mind. My savior gave me a phone number to call her when I felt better and drove off. It was 5 a.m., and I'd left the bar at 10. That's all I can remember a week later, and my wallet showed up in my mailbox.